Welcome to the One Solve Mystery YouTube channel and our exclusive series, Jean Monnet's Web Truths. On this evening's episode, we will be featuring the 2016 Investigation Discovery Special, Jean Monnet, An American Murder Mystery, Part 2, A Pool of Suspects. But as we do, without any further ado, let's get right into this. Look down there's a letter that she kidnapped. I think I said, oh my God, Burke or something. And, that, and I think he ran into to go check on Burke. I can tell you I have suspicion and I've thought about almost everybody because you just don't trust people. People that I would never, you think, could have been, I don't know, but how do you know? I have never it's one of the most enduring american mysteries why would somebody want john benet ramsey dead 20 years later that question still haunts us i wish there was justice for john benet we're not giving up this is something that needs to be done. Now, in the second of this three-part special investigation, when the Boulder Police Department's case is called into question... Law enforcement screwed up. They screwed up from day one. A new homicide detective takes over. This case was turned on its head. Lou Smith was convinced it was likely an intruder that got into that house and killed that child. It's a monster that did this. A slew of new suspects emerges. And John Bonet had a kind of a special bond. I'm 100% sure that he killed John Bonet. This might well have been an obsession that went terribly, terribly wrong. And later, the shocking twist no one saw coming. I just came out of this heated trance, and I was just like, oh my God, John Bonet, are you okay? In an exclusive interview for Investigation Discovery, the man who made this disturbing admission. She died accidentally. I did not say I killed her. There's a killer out there. This little girl that I had just seen was dead. Whoever did it was familiar with the family's daily routine. Their first suspects were John and Patsy Ramsey. Keep your baby close to you. It's a monster that did this. The Boulder Police Department wasn't prepared for this homicide or any homicide. We know this case is going to be solved. We know it. He fantasized about crushing a skull. Here is the largest unsolved crime in America. After Jean Benet Ramsey was found brutally murdered in her home in Boulder, Colorado, police quickly hone in on their prime suspect. The interrogation tapes make it clear that they have zeroed in right on Patsy. I didn't do it. I did not kill my child. I didn't have anything to do with it. They believe she snapped that night, that she is the one who did something horrible and then covered it up. The murder weapon, a garrote made with a paintbrush, belonged to Patsy. And the ransom note that had been left at the house seemingly matched her handwriting. Was that all too coincidental? In addition to Patsy and John Ramsey, there was one other person in the house that night, Jean Benet's older brother, Burke. Does he know what happened? I'm Judith Phillips friend of Betsy Ramsey. Burke, when he was born, was the apple of his parents' eyes. And along comes this little girl. And once they started into the pageant preparation, all the attention that he got was thrown on John Bonet. And I don't know if he was jealous or not, but I would have been. I saw emotional outbursts from Burke all the time. Burke hit John Bonet before. She had a scar right here in her cheek when he had hit her with a golf club. And some believe that on Christmas night, Burke once again struck his sister. I believe he hit her, not meaning to fatally hurt her. 
So in order to protect the one living child they had left, which was Burke, they figured out a cover-up. Police have long wondered if Burke may know the truth. I'm Michelle Wood. I'm an active homicide detective and an interrogation expert. A year and a half after John JonBenet Ramsey's murder, the police finally get the chance to interview the one person who can crack this case wide open, and that's Burke Ramsey. Michelle has extensively studied the videotapes of Burke's police interview, and she believes one aspect of his behavior stands out. Some of the questions that the investigator was asking him were obviously making him uncomfortable. And the reason you can tell is his body language completely changed. At one point, he actually goes into a fetal position and kind of like covers himself up. At that point, I think he was uncomfortable, but I don't necessarily know if he was being deceptive. And when the detective asks Burke a couple questions, his response is, not that I recall. What's strange is the fact that his mom uses the exact same phrase during her interrogation. That I recall. No. That I recall. This suggests to me that Burke was coached, either by his parents or by a media coach. Despite Burke's lack of emotion and his awkwardness in different parts of the investigation, I do not believe that he is the person who is responsible for this crime. Burke might know that his parents had something to do with the murder, but he doesn't want to say something that will end up sending his parents to jail. By the close of the interview, police are no closer to answering several nagging questions, but they still suspect that Patsy is the most likely killer. As the investigation grinds on, attention soon turns to the office working to build a case against the Ramseys. I'm Bo Deedle. I'm a retired New York City homicide detective. I was hired by the National Choir to follow the investigation. Alex Hunter, the district attorney at that time, was under enormous pressure. This was such a high profile case, but he felt as though he really couldn't charge the Ramseys on this case. The reason why is that he discovers so many things that went awry that had a domino effect from the very beginning of this investigation. Patsy calls 911, begs them to hurry. And then Patsy picks up the phone and starts calling friends. They start arriving to console them. Detectives start arriving. More friends keep coming, and this goes on for hours and hours and hours. That it's a Sunday social. I mean, the only thing missing is the ice cream. This is not good. There was absolutely no control. Zero. My name is Bob Whitson. I'm a retired sergeant with the Boulder Police Department. The main mistake I made was not removing the people from the house. At this point, every single room in that house is a crime scene. Yet the police detectives let people traipse in and out. That was a terrible lapse in judgment. You are introducing hair particles, DNA evidence, all that stuff into, into a scene. Patsy Ramsey and her friends were in the kitchen cleaning up. This is where the alleged kidnapper sat and wrote that two and a half page note. That room should have been completely isolated, not allowed to be cleaned up. Then at that point, police officers leave Detective Lindar alone at the crime scene. She should have never been put in that situation. That's a recipe for disaster. I was a supervisor. It was a mistake. We had a meeting scheduled with the FBI, and we were shorthanded because of being the day after Christmas and people were gone on vacation. So I uh, left Detective Arndt there while Patterson and I went to the meeting. Detective Linda Arndt had no experience in missing persons cases, kidnapping, doesn't have a homicide background. Linda Arndt tells John Ramsey, go look for things out of the ordinary. You've allowed somebody who potentially could be a suspect to go search the home. Now that is just mind blowing. What happens next 
is John Ramsey finds his little girl in that cellar. And he picks her up and he takes her upstairs and he places her on front of Linda Arndt and Patsy Ramsey. The fact that, that John removed Jean Benet's body from the location it was found really hinders the case. You want to preserve the place, especially where a body is found. John Ramsey then puts a sheet over the body. The sheet further creates contamination issues because whatever is on the sheet now can get transferred to the body. This would be a textbook example of how not to conduct a homicide investigation. Law enforcement screwed up. They screwed up from day one. The Boulder Police Department really wasn't prepared for this homicide or any homicide. They were used to handling one, maybe two homicides a year. Then, in March 1997, three months after Jean Bonnet's murder, the district attorney makes a bold decision. Alex Hunter is frustrated with the Boulder Police Department. He wanted to bring in a detective who did have homicide experience. He brought in Lou Smith to conduct his own investigation. Lou Smith was a, a former homicide detective with the Colorado Springs Police Department. Lou Smith had a 30-year career. He arrested over 200 people, having approximately a 100% conviction rate. Lou was a heck of a good investigator, probably one of the top three or four in the state. Smith set out to work this case as hard as he could. Lou is from the old school. Follow the evidence to where the evidence takes you. He believes the police maybe missed some very important evidence. So he goes back and he looks at everything. Upon closer inspection of the crime scene photos, Smith uncovers something intriguing. We heard from the police that there were no indications of forced entry into that house. But Lou Smith sees that there was indeed a broken window in the basement. John Ramsey told police that he had broken the basement window several weeks or months earlier because he got mocked out of the house. Sadly, he never replaced it. Police concluded that the window was too small for someone to have actually entered into the Ramsey's mansion. But Lou Smith disproved that theory by entering that broken window himself on camera. This is a perfect place to go in because nobody can see it. In the crime scene photos, Smith notices something else out of place. There was a suitcase up against the wall underneath the open window. Police had dismissed the suitcase as insignificant, but Smith believes this may be another vital clue. According to John Ramsey and the family's housekeeper, that blue suitcase was never housed in the basement, yet it was found after John Bonet was killed. Where did this suitcase come from? That is another piece of evidence that we can't just easily ignore. As Lou continued his investigation, he discovered something police had not, a partial footprint in the cement near where the body was discovered. Now, he was able to establish that that footprint came from a high-tech brand boot. Inevitably, the first port of call is to establish whether anyone inside that house owned a high-tech brand boot. No one did. Patsy, no. John, no. So Smith concludes that that footprint must have come from someone outside the house. Upon analyzing the autopsy photos, Smith finds something even more alarming. There were some things that were very, very suspicious. The autopsy report revealed a couple of abrasions on the little girl. Two sets of marks, one set on John Bonet's back, one on her face. The Boulder Police Department will only say there are abrasions of a unknown object. Due to the exact placement of the marks, Smith determines they could have only come from one source. It was the theory of Smith that she was hit with a stun gun. A stun gun is used to immobilize someone and knock them out. He asked, did the Ramseys ever own a stun gun? No was the answer. So uh, that makes him wonder, hmm, where did the stun gun come from? Because it's not in the house. For Smith, this new evidence points to one thing. 
His conclusion was counter to what most of the detectives had already concluded. Smith was convinced it was likely an intruder that got into that house and killed that child. After discovering police missteps in the Jean Benet Ramsey murder case, the Boulder District Attorney tasks legendary detective Lou Smith to conduct his own investigation. As Lou Smith continued his investigation, he seemingly was uncovering missteps that the police had overlooked and concluded that an intruder completed this heinous and hideous crime. After a full review of the case, Smith pieces together a new theory as to what happened on December 25th. The Ramseys got up on Christmas Day, and like millions of other Americans, they opened presents together, and then around 4 or 4.30, they went to their friend's house, the Whites. Fleet and Priscilla White were really good friends of the Ramseys. According to Smith, while the Ramseys were at their friend's house on Christmas Day, the intruder entered the home through the broken window. There, the intruder wrote the ransom note and laid in wait. When the family returned home, they went to bed. It's then suggested that the intruder entered John Bonet's bedroom, used the stun gun to subdue her, and then carry her to the basement. To carry John Bonet out of the house, the intruder orchestrated a plot to put her body inside the blue suitcase. But when it wouldn't fit out the window, he panicked. He sexually assaulted her and hit her across the head with a blunt object, causing her to die. The intruder then escaped the home with the stun gun through the broken window. Furthermore, Smith believes that the rope found around Jean Bonnet's neck offers insight into the killer's identity. A garrot is typically some sort of a stick or solid object that's used in conjunction with a cord to tighten a noose around the neck of the victim. If you look at the sexual assault, you look at the garrot, it bleeds of somebody who is involved in some type of sexual deviance. Primarily, maybe some type of pedophile. Smith believes that the profile of a violent and sadistic killer rules out the Boulder Police Department's prime suspect. I've been an investigator for the Ramsey family for the last 18 years. I was brought on to assist Lou Smith to determine whether or not there was sufficient evidence to support that the Ramseys did it. I've dissected this case forwards and backwards that I can say with absolute certainty that John or Patsy Ramsey had nothing to do with the murder of their daughter. The idea that two God-fearing people decided to kill their daughter by stun gunning her, taking her to the basement, sexually assaulting her, strangling her to death, and then beating her over the head? I mean, come on. If Smith's theory is correct, the Ramseys have been telling the truth all along. If anyone knows anything, please, please help us for the safety of all the children. We have to find out who did this. Smith believes that Jean Bonnet's status in the pageant community may have unwittingly made her a target. John Bonnet was a pedophile's dream come true. The brutality of the killing showed me that this man is a sadistic pedophile. I believe he brought her down to the farthest, deepest part of that basement and did very brutal things to her. Roughly a year into Smith's investigation, critical new evidence comes to light that further supports his intruder theory. The autopsy clearly showed there were spots of blood in her underwear. Well, the initial testing that was done on John Bonnet Ramsey's underwear showed a mixture of DNA, partly her DNA and a minor contribution from somebody other than her. The DNA results specifically stated that the source of that DNA on her underwear were not from anybody in the Ramsey family. Not Burke, 
not Patsy, not John, not anybody in the Ramsey family. It's a monster that did this. We need to look at other people that were in and around the Boulder area December 25th, 26th of 1996. Lou questioned John in 1998, and the contents of that interrogation was a bombshell. You got any ideas who this could be? Don't he proceeded to suggest a family friend could have been the murderer. Bill McReynolds was a tantalizing suspect for police. Bill McReynolds was a journalism professor retired, but with the very distinctive look, white hair and a big bushy beard, he looked like Santa and in fact even played him on television. For several years, he had played Santa Claus at their Christmas parties. The children loved him. It was obvious that Jean Monnet and Burke just really liked him a lot. I mean, who wouldn't love Santa Claus at Christmas time, right? But as Ramsey tells Smith, something about McReynolds never sat right with him. You know, we, we were suspicious of McReynolds, I guess, in the beginning. And, and um, he was the only one. He came to the memorial service. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, who was there said, uh, you guys need to go back and look at that video because when Patsy went up to hug him, he pushed her away. You'd think that he would be willing to embrace her. Did it mean that he was responsible for the child's death and couldn't bear to hug John Binet's mother? As interrogators press John, he reveals another peculiar detail. In the weeks following Jean Benet's death, McReynolds seemed desperate for public attention. He certainly showed up on the Today Show a week later, right in the middle of it. I adore the family. They've adopted me as a member of the family, actually. We don't celebrate children enough, Katie. His behavior just seemed a little strange, and it raised some flags. He and John Monet had a kind of a special little bond. She worshipped him, Santa Claus. And indeed, prior to John Bonet's murder, she took him on a personal tour of the home. She showed Santa Bill the basement. She showed Santa Bill her bedroom. She seemingly was in complete awe of Santa Bill and even believed that he was the real Santa Claus. John Ramsey suggests that John Bonet's affection for McReynolds could explain a perplexing piece of evidence. That would, in my mind, explain how, if, if we said John Bonet had pineapple between 19 and she went to bed, and we found her. There was undigested pineapple in her digestive system. It is believed that whoever killed her fed her the pineapple because it all happened that evening. That is the only way it's possible to be that she could be that someone she knew and trusted him. He's a little constant upstairs. He'd be a surprise. Why they would have sat and had pineapple and glass of tea, I don't know. She would have done that without causing commotion or waking anyone up in the house because she had so much trust in Santa Bill. When investigators went into Jean Bonnet's room, they find he had given Jean Bonnet a little note right before Christmas that said, something special will happen to you after Christmas. Whoa, what did that mean? John and Patsy Ramsey always claimed an intruder killed their daughter, six-year-old Jean Bonnet. But is it possible that the Ramseys actually knew the killer? For several years, Bill McReynolds played Santa Claus at their Christmas parties. He was a beloved figure, a fixture at the home of the Ramses, but it soon was established that Santa had a deep and dark, sinister past. They looked more deeply into McReynolds' background and discovered, as a bizarre side note in this bizarre story, that his daughter and another little friend had been kidnapped and one of the young girls molested by a sexual predator. The perpetrator was never found. That crime, 22 years to the date, 
before John Benet Ramsey's murder. That's not all. In addition, they find out that McReynolds' wife, she wrote a major play about a young girl who was tortured and murdered in her own basement. Investigators become convinced that they're dealing with something more than just crazy coincidences. Police zeroed in on Bill as a prime suspect. And he's brought in for an interrogation. They know that he played Santa Claus for the Ramses. They know he knew Jean Benet and the layout of the house. What they need to know is if he was in that house that night. He says that he was having dinner on Christmas night with his family about an hour and a half away from the Ramsey's mansion and that he slept through the night uninterrupted. Investigators consult with McReynolds' family and his alibi checks out, but they also discover something new. Just a few months before Jean Benet's death, he had undergone a major heart-lung surgery. He was a pretty frail man. It would have taken some strength to get this child all the way down into the basement and bound her as she was found. But police got from McReynolds and his wife hair samples, saliva samples, handwriting samples as well, and ultimately were forced to exclude them as suspects. Despite Bill McReynolds' connection and coincidences with the Ramsey family, investigators need to look elsewhere. Time passes with little significant movement in the case. Then, almost four years after Jean Bonnet's murder, there's an unexpected lead. The Boulder police get a call one day from the University of Colorado campus police. They have someone in custody they think Boulder police might be interested in. They have just arrested a 38-year-old man for trespassing. He was wearing a backpack, but it's what's inside that grabbed their attention. They found a poem about John Bonnet and a stun gun. A stun gun is what Lou Smith believed had been used to subdue John Bonnet Ramsey. So who is this guy? Could he be the real killer? His name is Gary Oliva. When police question Gary Oliva, they find out some very interesting information. He was a convicted child sex offender in Oregon, where he molested a young girl. He also served time in prison because he attempted to strangle his own mother with a telephone call. So now we have both the attraction to young girls and strangulation in his background. There was a point that he was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. And he always had problems with his family. He was always out of control. Police also learned that Oliva was hanging around the Boulder area at the time Jean Benet was killed. He was a homeless man who spent some time at a homeless shelter, a church, about 10 houses down from the Ramses. So he knew that neighborhood. It's plausible to suggest that he may have walked past the Ramsey's home multiple times in the days or the weeks leading up to the murder and eyeballed John Benet Ramsey and suggested that she was going to be his next target. As investigators scour Oliva's past, they re examine old photos and video relating to the case and uncover another link to the Ramsey's. About a year after the murder one year to the date they had a candlelight vigil at the ramsey's house it was a real cold night and there wasn't that many people there and who shows up gary oliva my experience criminals that commit crimes a lot of times they show up the scene of the crime they show up at the funerals and this is just something in their mind their sick minds that they want to see what they caused Next, police probe Gary about the poem he wrote, entitled Ode to Jean Benet, found in his backpack. Gary openly admitted to police that he had an obsession with the little girl. In addition to that, he told police that he was having dreams about Jean Benet after her murder. Even more creepy, he'd created a shrine to Jean Benet in his own very home printing out photos of her as a beauty queen from the internet and putting them up on his wall. Even putting her face on Monopoly money. Sick. An obsession. And police believed that this might well have been an obsession that went terribly, terribly wrong. When 38-year-old drifter Gary Oliva 
Shiva is arrested for trespassing. The stun gun and poem to Jean Benet Ramsey found in his backpack make him a prime suspect. He's a convicted child molester. He has a history of violence, and he admits to being obsessed with Jean Benet. On top of everything police already knew about Gary Oliva, they now find out that he created a shrine to Jean Benet. He would cut out her picture and put it on Monopoly money. He took his obsession to another level. But he tells police he would never hurt or injure Jean Benet. He loved her too much, so much so, he told police he would often look at photos of her and cry. When asked about that telltale piece of evidence, the stun gun, Gary told police that he'd been given it by a friend only for his own personal protection. The police are not convinced and submit Oliva to a battery of tests. They investigated him thoroughly. They took his handwriting and saliva samples. They believed he had done a horrible thing. But in the end, it all came back not a match. They just could not put him at the scene of that crime. There we were, back to square one, with no killer and no answers. Then, a seemingly unrelated crime leads to a new suspect. It's Valentine's Day, 1997. 43-year-old junkyard mechanic John Kennedy finds cop cars swarming a house on the salvage yard's property. So I pull up and I walk over to the cop. I said, what's going on here? And he says, well, there's been a death in the family. John discovers that the person inside is his longtime friend, 26-year-old Michael Helgoth. I met Michael Helgoth at the junkyard. He was one of the three brothers that owned the junkyard. He'd gotten out of the service, and he was staying at the yard, working there, pulling parts. Between Mike and I, we could fix just about anything. We kind of formed a, a friendship. Kennedy soon learns what exactly happened to Helgoth inside the trailer. Police discover him inside his house, dead, with a gunshot wound and a gun next to him. It's soon established this was a suicide. It just really hit me then. I was just almost in a state of shock because I thought, wow, this is strange. In my wildest dreams at that moment, I never thought he was even capable of something like that. Soon after, news reports on the Ramsey case catch Kennedy's eye. It was a week or so after Mike died. They started putting that out. There was a ransom note asking for 118000 That's where I made the connection to Mike. I just remember I had a conversation in November of 96. Michael Helgoth, he's all happy, and I said, what's up, Mike? He says, well, me and a partner are going to make this killer deal right at Christmas, and we're going to make 50 or 60,000. And then he says, and we'll be able to finish all our car projects. And I just kind of thought, well, this sounds like something I don't want to hear. The fact that he said him and a partner were going to make 50 or 60,000 right at Christmas, and then the ransom says 118. That was an odd thing to me. But according to Kennedy, his friend's fortune never changed. About the third or fourth somewhere of January, I went to see Mike and Terry. I said, well, what about that killer deal you had? And he kind of looks down and gets all depressed as well. That went by the wayside. It starts making sense that something went wrong. Adding fuel to the suspicion, Helgoth had a sordid past. He had a repeated pattern of behavior of assaulting and torturing animals. Mike used to shoot the cats with a 22 Beretta on the run. And then I saw the aftermath of one where he was throwing cats on the ground, kittens basically, and killing them. He would just take and wrench their neck and break their neck. Mike does have a record of sexual assault on a child. Girlfriend of Mike's, she caught him naked underneath the, the sheets and her daughter was on top and he told her that he couldn't trust himself with her. Then, Kennedy recalls the most disturbing anecdote of all. September somewhere, we're walking at the end of the day. And he just pops up and says, out of the blue, he says, I wonder what it'd be like to crack a human skull. Mike told me that he wanted to crack a human skull. She had a crack in her skull. With all the pieces adding up, 
Kennedy decides to act on his dark suspicion. I called the sheriff's department. I thought that they needed to know a few things. I told him, I said, I have some information about Mike. The police said, this isn't our guy. This isn't our man. We're looking for one sick, twisted individual. So I looked at her, and my reply was, he was sick, he was twisted, he was an individual. Police initially weren't interested in Helgoff as a suspect, but Lou Smith was. And as Lou poured through the evidence, he became intrigued. Then they looked at Michael Helgoff's crime scene photos, and they concluded that he could well have been the intruder and killer. Where he died. The first thing you see at the, at the foot of the door is a pair of high-tech boots. We know there was a high-tech boot impression found at the crime scene. There was a stun gun found to the upper part of his body near a tape recorder. That stun gun, the same type of stun gun that was used in the death of John Bonet. I'm 100% sure that Michael Helgoth and a partner are guilty of killing John Bonet Ramsey. John Kennedy is convinced that his recently deceased friend, Michael Helgoth, took a secret to his grave. Michael Lennon and Helgoth and a partner are guilty of killing John Bonet Ramsey. The fact that he wanted to crack a human skull, she had a crack in her skull. The fact that there was a boot print from a high-tech boot, he had high-tech boots. The fact that he said him and a partner were going to make 50 or 60,000 right at Christmas, and then the ransom says 118. Also next to his body, they find a stun gun. This looks very promising to them. While the Boulder police don't seem to consider Helgoth a viable suspect, District Attorney Investigator Lou Smith thinks that Helgoth may be the intruder he's been looking for. Lou Smith believed that Helgoth and his business partner entered into the home and tried to abduct John Bonet Ramsey for the ransom. The stun gun is used, but things go horribly wrong, and she's accidentally killed. As Smith continues to study Helgoth's case, he begins to wonder about the circumstances surrounding his death. There was a picture taken of a pillowcase that had a bullet hole through the pillowcase. Now think about this, this guy lives by himself. Why would he care who hears a bullet going out of a gun? They discover that Helgoth is right-handed. The shot that took his life came from the left. The bullet traveled in an upward direction, and it didn't perforate, it didn't, it didn't exit his body. It simply stayed lodged in his body. That doesn't sound like suicide. That sounds like a murder. Well, basically, I think somebody was in the house and shot Mike on that night and exited. So the question is, why? Why would somebody want Michael Helgoth dead? Uh, I believe Mike was murdered by his partner for the simple fact that, that Mike was going to rat him out and the uh, other individual or individuals didn't want to take the rap for this crime. With their theory fully formed, Smith and his team are convinced that Helgoth is the killer. But police think the evidence is lacking. Despite this tantalizing suspect, police say his DNA didn't match. Undeterred, Smith and his team press police to test Helgoth's boots against the footprint found in the Ramsey's basement. Uh, the boots, we were told, did not match. Consequently, we tried to find out why, and we never could get an answer from the Boulder Police Department. And they would not give me a reason that it didn't match. They just kept saying, well, it doesn't match. It doesn't match. Unfortunately, we had a very poor working relationship with Boulder Police Department. There was no teamwork between the Boulder District Attorney's Office and the Boulder Police Department with the end objective of, we're going to solve this case. 
so despite the fact that the Boulder DA's office was coming up with some interesting suspects under an intruder theory, the Boulder Police Department was steadfast in their belief that Patsy Ramsey was responsible for their daughter's death. There's really only two schools of thought in this whole case. You either believe that the family had something to do with it, or you believe that an intruder did it. In the midst of this heated public debate, Lou Smith resigns from the DA's investigative team. Lou feared that John and Patsy were going to be convicted and locked up for the rest of their lives, and he couldn't take it, and therefore distanced himself and quit the case. Two years had gone by, and there was no resolution to this case. Now, the DA was under even more immense pressure. Then, in August of 1998, a surprising statement is released to the press. The district attorney elects to convene a grand jury investigation. The grand jury's goal, to determine if there's enough evidence to bring criminal charges against any of the suspects involved. There was intense interest in this grand jury, and there was an expectation by the public that someone was going to be charged with Jean Benet's death, and that someone was probably going to be Patsy and or someone in the Ramsey household. On September 15th, 1998, the grand jury sessions begin. They examine over 30,000 exhibits of evidence. What happens next behind closed doors will determine the fate of the Ramseys. Next time on Jean Bonnet, an American murder mystery. Everybody wanted this case solved. Was it this wealthy couple who did it, or was there a murderer on the loose? In a shocking twist, a bizarre recluse is thrust into the spotlight. He calls himself Daxus. Daxus said some very disturbing things. He says he was having sex with this child. So I just kept telling her that she was a good little girl and that I loved her. Here is a guy who has confessed to murdering the little beauty queen, the largest unsolved crime in America. In an exclusive interview, we meet this infamous figure. I was with her when she died. I did not say I killed her. Reveal new insights into critical pieces of evidence. The DNA test results should not be what this case hangs on. I think it would be a mistake to rule anybody, even John Mark Carr, out as a possible suspect in John Bonet's murder. And share allegations from inside the office that controls the case. You either keep your mouth shut about this case or you fall in line. But that concludes this evening's program on the One Solved Mystery YouTube channel. If you are enjoying the programming, please leave a comment below and consider hitting the like, subscribe, and notification bell so that you can be notified when new videos drop. And I hope to see some of you next Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for our next regularly scheduled programming.